challenge for us uh, becomes being more like you that it doesn't stop at your redemption. How do we seek you? How do we seek to serve you? How do we seek to grow as disciples? How do we become your kingdom? Your kingdom is here and it is now. And so, Father, give us open ears and open hearts to hear the word that you've delivered to Pastor Joe today that will help us as the kingdom learn how to love you and to love one another better. In the name of your son, amen. You may be seated. Man, it's good to see you guys today. So, yeah. Well, you know, Megan has this. Was that? Yeah. So, I, there's a great story. So, whenever it rains on a Sunday morning, I can hear up and I, I wake up and I hear Megan's voice. Oh, the rain's going to keep the Christians away. But this is a this is a pretty good crowd for a rainy Sunday. So, you guys are good Christians. So, and those that aren't here, we'll discuss them some other time. So. Hey, just, just a, quick, a quick couple of things I want to share with you. Here in the next week or so, there's something really exciting happening. It's called Living, the Living the Grace Life podcast. It will be dropping later on this week. It's not going to be the sermon. It's just going to be like a weekly type of uh, uh, in-depth look at things going on at Grace Life and stuff like that. I'm very excited about it. Then just a couple of weeks after that, we've been working really hard and spending a lot of time and resources on launching the Grace Life app for Apple and Android. Prefer, yeah, it's going to be, I, I'm really excited, but it's going to be a great way to communicate and stay connected because part of the challenge at Grace Life, it's, it's a good thing that we don't have an expensive building, but it's also a challenge because we don't have a central place where everything happens. We have some big plans for this app to make you feel more like you're connected to your church throughout the week. Some live video stuff is going to take place at different places that we meet during the week and things like that. A lot of cool things coming, so keep your eyes and ears peeled. For later on this week, you'll get a notification about the Living the Grace Life podcast. And then when the Grace Life app uh, drops, I expect you to install it immediately and turn on all notifications. <laughs> so my name's Joe Davis. I'm the pastor here. We're starting a new series. We just finished off 2 John last week, and we're starting 3 John this week. We'll probably go two or three weeks, or four or five, but probably two or three uh, it's a very short book. Uh, I've titled this series, No Greater Joy, Part 1. So just real quick, a little bit of insight on, on 3 John. It's, it's one of the least preached books in the New Testament. Many believe that 3 John was actually written before 1 John, before the apostle got his rebuke on, if you know what I'm saying, right? Because he was talking about some people in 1 John that were causing problems. 3 John is a little more positive. Uh, so many people think it was written before 1 John. It was probably written near or in the last decade of the first century. John is older, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And if you guys remember, in 2 John, the apostle warned about not sanctioning or showing hospitality to false teachers who wanted to come in and hurt the church. Well, actually, 3 John takes, and this is why many people think it was written after or before 1 and 2 John, 3 John takes the other side of this and encourages people to be uh, hospitable to those who are traveling and doing ministry. So uh, the title of today's message of part one of 3 John is How Truth Brings Joy. So this last week at our shepherd team, we spent some time talking about many of you. And some of it was good. <laughs> Most all of it was good. And in these meetings, the funnest part of these meetings is when we start to brag about the stunning things that God is doing in the hearts of our little precious flock here at Grace Life. And it reminds us, it reminds us just how powerful the truth of the gospel is that lives in the lives of God's people. Nothing inspires and encourages a church more to love truth than when we see evidence that truth is actually working. The faithfulness of God's people creates this joy and it inspires confidence in the absolute truth of the gospel. And this is the example that we see today in 3 John. So let me read the passage for today. Uh, the elder, that's John, to, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking 
in the truth. So really quick, when he says my children, he's not talking about Gaius being a son. He's talking about being a son in the faith, a, ch a child as an, a younger person in the churches that John was leading, John the elder. He starts off by saying, John the elder, I'm writing to you, my beloved Gaius. I hear some amazing things about you. And it just makes my heart so full of joy to know that there are people like you that are being faithful to the truth. So like we do at Grace Life, we go and take each passage with three applications. The first one is the historical side of it. What about man? What did he do? And who is it and why and how they do it? So I want to talk about the faithful Gaius. What was it about this man that caused John to write a personal letter to him? He is the recipient. Now, there are several men in the New Testament that are named Gaius, and all of them are somehow involved in the work of the church. So we don't know which one of those this is, or if it's either maybe even another Gaius. We're not sure, but we know that we can speculate that this Gaius was probably wealthy, and he was well known for his hospitality to first century missionaries, people traveling and speaking on behalf of the apostles, people going from town to town, and, and Gaius was known for opening up his house and going above and beyond and providing what was needed for these people that were serving God. That's who he is. And that's what he's known for. He's developed uh, this reputation of faithfulness to the gospel. And he says, the brothers have made this report. The brothers are likely these missionaries or other elders and pastors who are traveling and speaking. John, we got to tell you, Every time we go to these churches, every time we're there, Gaius just goes above and beyond. He gives us the best room, feeds us, clothes us, gives us everything we need to make sure that we can do the job that you've given us, that God has called us to do. And let me tell you something, John. He is amazing with how he loves the truth. He is committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not trying to adulterate it. He's not trying to change it. He's not trying to market it better or make it different or more modern. John, he is staying true to the gospel that he heard the first time. And man, he's faithful. You would love what he's doing. So that's what we know about who he is and what he's known for. And I want to talk about the impact his faithfulness has on John the Elder, the last living apostle. These brothers had noticed and thought it was significant enough that they wanted to publicly let John know, hey, listen, this gayest guy, he is a superstar. His consistent faithfulness and evidence of transformation truly stands out. It's above and beyond. It's head and shoulders. And when John hears this, he is moved to write this letter and he affirms Gaius' support for people in ministry. Can you imagine how Gaius must have felt knowing that other people went back and said to John, listen, this guy's doing great. They didn't go back and say, yeah, Gaius was okay, but the sheets were dirty. <laughs> His wife's not that good of a cook, you know, so we had to take out McDonald's a lot, but, you know, he's there. No, listen, Gaius does more than we could ever ask. He does a great job and he loves the gospel. Can you imagine how Gaius must have felt knowing that he's just, whatever, he's just doing his job? Faithful service has had such an impact on these people. Can you understand now why John felt such warmth for this man Gaius? I mean, think about it. His faithfulness is a driving force to keep John motivated and in the battle, even in his late 80s to early 90s. <laughs> <clears throat> the excitement about how God's truth is still at work and is still transforming people even 70 years at least after he had grieved the death of Jesus. John is overjoyed that Gaius is walking in the truth, not just because he's glad for Gaius, but John is saying, man, this gospel I've given my life to is real. It works. Gaius, I want you to know, nothing brings me more joy than to hear people like you are faithfully serving God. So that's the historical narrative behind these first four verses. Talk about the spiritual side of this. What does God do and why and how does he do it? I want to talk about the truth that transformed Gaius. So this was my uh, a social media campaign this week. 
Uh, a compromised gospel is powerless to produce supernatural transformation or heavenly comfort. It will breed intellectual compromise and spiritual discouragement. So this is part of the problem, right? So what's, what, what's going on is John is referring to the word truth four times just in the first four verses. He's not talking about just Gaius. He's talking about Gaius, you are connected to the truth. The truth that I have been preaching from the first day until now. And what I found to be true is when churches try to adjust or amend the gospel, maybe they want to spice it up a little bit. They remove the greatest earthly benefit, which is its incredible power to transform a heart in life. Amen. If someone's concept of truth, whatever it is, even if it brings them some sort of philosophical comfort or whatever, if what you think of as truth is powerless to transform, it's a waste of time. It just can't bring joy if it can't change your life. I don't care what it is. And so what I want to talk about this truth, I want you to understand a couple things. First of all, it is absolute truth. So this is an interesting concept, right? So many times what we hear today in today's world is that truth is relative. No. Truth is not relative. Truth is constant. And so here's a verse for you in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, God and men, the man Jesus Christ. This is important. Here's another one I'll share with you, Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So if you believe in the gospel of the scriptures, the gospel of the apostles, the gospel of Jesus, then you have to believe in an absolute truth when it comes to how we are connected to Heavenly Dad. Humans left to our own will flounder, We'll flop around on what's true, sometimes driven by emotion, experiences and circumstances and convenience, comfort. When we talk about truth today, we're talking about truth with a capital D. We are referring to spiritual absolutes that do not change, that are not flexible and malleable depending upon culture. It doesn't mean, listen carefully, just because we believe in absolute truth doesn't mean that we're always right about what that truth is. Sometimes we think we're declaring absolute truth and we make errors. Well, you, but no, I'm just kidding, all of us. It's just a joke, people. But that is where an absolute truth comes in, that it comes from God, not us. People say we can't trust absolutes because we don't know everything. How can you believe truth is absolute? You don't, well, that's just a silly uh, position to take. Just because we don't know the whole truth doesn't mean we can't trust the concept that truth is absolute. I mean, think about it. If truth isn't absolute, it's not truth by its definition. But by the gift of faith, here's where the difference is. While we don't understand all of absolute truth, by the gift of faith, we are able to entrust ourselves to God. We believe he has the absolute truth that we need. And through the gift of faith, we spend a life seeking and following and pursuing after the God that holds the absolute truth. So that's the first thing about the truth that transformed Gaius. It was absolute. The second thing about the truth that transformed Gaius is it was transformational. See, here's the thing. We love in today's society when truth is anecdotal, when it's catchy, when it's marketable. Truth is not anecdotal, it's powerful. There's a big difference. Here's a verse in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, 21 and 22. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. What a powerful concept. This truth that is absolute is also transformational. We believe that his truth has the power to change a heart and transform a life and connect us to God 
forever in a way that changes the way we interact with the world around us. The fact is, without absolute truth, we will have no transformation. Because transformation has to have a starting point and an ending place. And if truth is not absolute, by definition, it has no starting point or ending place. It just has malleable, flexible points that we like to make. And possibly they make us feel good one day and bad the next, so we switch them around. But absolute truth is where the power of transformation lies. And then the next part about this truth that tra transformed Gaius is it's sovereign. This is my favorite and probably the most offensive part of it. <laughs> See, sovereign truth is purposeful in its application and impact. The impact of absolute truth and transformational truth is not left to chance. It's not random. It's not left to circumstances. It has a specific goal, a specific objective, and truth, if it's absolute, will absolutely achieve everything it is supposed to every time. Truth does not fail. Truth always succeeds no matter what. So my favorite couple of verses in the Bible, some of you know this, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this, faith, is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. Faith is a, that's where I get it from, in case you thought I made it up. It's not a result of work so that no one will brag. And then I love verse 10, right? And this is where the, what, God, what God's transformational, absolute, sovereign truth did for Gaius. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And the translation can be read that we trip over. This is what's so amazing about God's absolute, transformational, sovereign truth. There's no escaping the transformation. Well, we applied the right truth, but it just didn't work. That's not the case. The concept is so crucial to understanding the scope of just how powerful truth is. Truth transforms people and conforms them to the image of Christ and enables them for good works that he deemed good and prepared for them beforehand. It's important to understand that the good work that Gaius was known for in this story was a direct result of sovereign, absolute truth that God had implanted in his life through the gift of faith. The passage teaches us that Gaius had been prepared and reserved for his faithfulness beforehand. Before. The faithfulness of Gaius was a direct result of the sovereign gift of faith that he had been graciously given. So Gaius couldn't brag about his goodness that encouraged John. Because Paul teaches us in Ephesians, it came from God who prepared the works beforehand that he would just basically trip over. He couldn't avoid them. So that is the nature of the truth that transformed Gaius into this amazing, encouraging figure in John's life. We got that? Let's look at the personal. What about us? What do we do and why and how do we do it? So the personal side of this says calling out faithfulness, but I'm going to change that. Pretend like you see me backspacing right now and retyping. <laughs> Celebrating faithfulness. See, part of loving truth, part of loving truth is celebrating the impact it's having in your brothers and sisters, especially in your church. I mean, John and his leaders experienced amazing joy from what they saw God doing in the lives of others, specifically in this story, Gaius. You guys have, remember, I've given you this definition of joy. And, you know, people think, what is joy? Is it happiness? Well, no, it's not happiness. Is it uh, comfort? Well, no, it's not comfort. Here's the definition of joy. And if you haven't heard it yet, it's easy to memorize. It is the supernatural satisfaction with the presence of God over anything else. And what John says is, nothing gives me supernatural satisfaction with the presence of God over anything else as much as hearing that you, Gaius, are walking faithfully in the truth. Your faithfulness reminds me of the presence of God. 
It reminds me that I can be satisfied supernaturally with God in my life because of why? What he's doing in you. There are those that say they love the truth, but don't declare what it's doing in the hearts of those around you. I mean, just look around the room right now. Don't let, don't let anybody see you looking at them because they'll get uncomfortable. <laughs> are there evidences of power of truth? In others in this room that bring you joy, supernatural satisfaction with the presence of God over anything else? Or is it possible that sometimes as a church or as humans, we get too indifferent about this? I mean, I like truth, but you know, maybe we get too cynical. Maybe we get too obsessed and too focused on people's flaws. Their deficiencies, which there are plenty. Their shortcomings. Maybe the world around us distracts us too much with fights about religion and politics and how horrible and awful Tom Brady is, whatever the case may be. <laughs> you know I had to go there. <laughs> but there are many things that keep us from celebrating, listen, celebrating the impact of truth. But the failure to celebrate the impact of truth likely means one of two things. You aren't very connected to God's people. You're not around them enough to see it. Or you haven't tasted transformational truth in your life, so you're unable to recognize it. Those are the two reasons that we don't celebrate God's truth. And both of these, actually, I didn't make these up. They're actually conditions that John talks about in 1 John as evidence of whether or not you have spiritual life. But confirmation of the power of God's truth inspires others. It inspires us when we see it happening in other people. It inspires us to be more faithful and gives us that same joy, supernatural satisfaction with the presence of God that John talked about in verses three and four. The ability to recognize and celebrate evidence of the power of truth in our brothers and sisters is so crucial <clears throat> to our health as a church. Because think about this. People always say, well, I, I want my faith to be more tangible. It's the most tangible way to experience the presence of God is by looking at and acknowledging the impact of this absolute truth in others. That's why he says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in truth. Okay. Back to our shepherd team. Our meeting this week. We're talking about many of you by name. And we celebrated together what God has clearly done in your lives. And it brought, and I'm sure it brought the rest of them joy, but I know it brought me joy, almost to the point of tears at one point, talking about some of you. It was the best part of the meeting. The rest of it was, ugh. <laughs> but that was awesome. Mega says, that's right, the rest was ugh, but this part was awesome. Look, I'm not trying to glorify the people that I'm about to talk about and I'm not trying to exclude anyone and say, well, these are the ones you should be like. They, they're great. The rest of y'all are horrible. It's not like that at all. <laughs> but I want to give an example, a picture of how you, us, how we should all celebrate the presence of God, joy, in the lives of others. Because God's truth gives us the ability to see it work in their lives. So I want to talk about a couple of people. And I've uh, gotten, per gotten permission. Well, even if they didn't give me permission, I told them I was doing it. <laughs> First guy I want to talk about, relentless, loyal, faithful service. Our brother Mike Bassett on the sound thing right there. Don't, don't, no, don't clap for him. Don't cla he doesn't deserve that. It's, <laughs> it's not that good. Uh, Mike has missed less weeks than anyone in the church. I think he's missed maybe two. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. So first thing is take a vacation. We'll let you know when though. We don't just don't up and leave. 
But his faithfulness to his family, his church, his brothers and sisters in Christ, it's hard to match it. And you know why? It's not because Mike is a great guy, although he is. The main reason is absolute sovereign truth has transformed his heart and life. And it brings me great joy, Mike, to see you walking in truth. Another guy I want to talk about, he's actually not in this room. He just got back from a week-long trip, business trip, and he's upstairs, I think, serving in the, with the children. Mark Choate. Mm -hmm. Genuine humility. Relentless willingness to love our church through service and faithfulness. It is so clear and evident that God's sovereign, absolute truth is transforming this man. And it makes my joy full to see him walking faithfully. I want to talk about my sister Hilda. You guys know about the miracle of God sparing us the pain of losing her in an accident. Amen. And now Hilda is a spiritual leader in our church, helping set the tone for prayer by overseeing and running our prayer ministry. Woo. Something we've struggled to find the right person to do. And we were sitting in a shepherd team meeting. We we're saying, who can we tap? And Jen Gillespie says, I know the perfect person, faithful, loving, it's Hilda. And we all said, absolutely. And so we hopefully she'll do it, right? <laughs> and, and Jen says she barely got it out of her mouth when Hilda said, absolutely, I'll do it. And it gives us great joy to see you walking in the truth and seeing how absolute sovereign truth has transformed your life. Talk about Cindy. Yes. Yes. Cindy, Woo. stop doing that for her. <laughs> so Cindy, I'm going to tell you, she loves God's word. I, I don't know of anybody else in the church, including your pastor, that studies it like her. She's a theological beast, by the way. She acts like she doesn't know much. She knows a lot. But something magical has happened in the last couple of years. God has transformed in her, her into a teacher and a discipler and a relentless server. Cooking food, taking it to people, and then taking notes and, and pre telling them what happened on Sunday morning or a deep end on Tuesday. And, and matter of fact, we were, were going through the book of Leviticus, and some of it's been really fun. And I said, I wish I had notes. And Cindy, oh, don't worry, I've got them. <laughs> and so, Cindy, it brings me great joy to see that God's sovereign, absolute truth is transforming you. And it gives me great joy to see you walking faithful to the truth. My brother, Josh Holden, man, your transformation, your value change just in the last couple years, your, your, by the way, people don't realize this, relentless service to our youth and our church. How important is that for us? What a great dad you're becoming. God's sovereign, absolute truth is changing you moment by moment. Trust me, he's not perfect. I know. But the direction he's going brings me such joy to hear when I talk to, to Pedro and Chris and they say, man, Josh is doing great. Josh, it brings me such joy to hear that our children are following the truth. I think of Chaz and Eva. The original small group that helped launch Grace Life was... Tori and Chaz, and then Eva came along, and the next thing I know, I'm buying dinner every night for 14 people at Chili's. <laughs> this has got to stop. We're starting a church. <laughs> Chaz and Eva, all these children running around, and they're constantly faithful. At Deep End, here on Sunday morning, whatever. Every time I turn around, oh, there's Chaz and Eva. When they're not there, I'm shocked. I'm a little worried. <laughs> oh, we're just late. Oh, okay. <laughs> You guys' values have been changed by absolute sovereign truth. And it brings me great joy to see you loving your Savior and your church and following in the truth. And we got Tori, sweet tea. Sweet tea. <laughs> We're so humbled to have a young woman like you as part of our church. You're going into an amazing woman of God. She's a theological beast too, even though she doesn't act like it. Monergism, synergism, she knows it back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> when I hear words from, the, from uh, some of the other ladies in our church that you fellowship with, and they say, man, sweet tea is just killing it. It brings me great joy to know that you're following the truth. 
And my brother Mark Curtis, from where you were three years ago to today, wow, that is an evidence of sovereign, powerful truth. I don't know what is. <laughs> because this guy has become my right-hand man, a staple for me in ministry. I don't know how I could do it without him. Every week, helping me run Grace Life Recovery, telling me when I'm doing it wrong, I need somebody like that. And Mark, what sovereign, absolute truth has done in your life cannot be denied. It reminds me, every time I might have a doubt about the gospel, uh-uh, Mark Curtis. Mm -hmm. When I hear about reports that you are walking faithful to God, it brings me great joy. Look, so many, I could go on and on and on until six o'clock tonight. But I don't have time for all that. But some of you will be hearing from me in the next week. Text, email, phone call. Because I feel like what this passage is teaching us is we need to do this more often, just like John did for Gaius. Because inevitably, listen, there are times that church work is really hard, heavy, and even discouraging. So we need Gaius's badly. We need to be reminded, oh no, it's real. Look what, look, what it, look what it did in the lives of this person or that person. And when I see Gaius's in our church, it's all worth it. More than worth it. When we see God's children faithfully committed to his word, his calling, and his people. It renews and reminds us of why we stand as a church unwavering behind God's absolute truth of the gospel we've heard from the first day until now because of the undeniable impact it has had and is having. It keeps us motivated to be faithful to that gospel that is transforming the hearts and lives of those around us in undeniable ways because we know that no other truth can produce the evidence of transformation and faithfulness that we love to celebrate. Heavenly Dad, we're so thankful that your truth is transformational. We're so thankful that you love us with the gospel. We're so thankful that you give us encouragement because the transformation of what you're doing is undeniable. Give us eyes to see it and lips that can speak it and encourage it. We have no greater joy than to hear the people in our church are following faithfully the truth of the gospel.